Hey everyone, welcome back to another YouTube video. I'm Rachel. And I'm Jessica. We are the Certified Occupational Therapy Assistants with Harkla. And today we are gonna talk about sensory bins, why we love them, and five fun ways to use them. I have a lot to say on the top. I know you do. <laughs> When you think of a sensory bin, what do you think about? Do you think about a box of rice with some letters in it, maybe some shaving cream? What comes to mind? What comes to mind for you? Usually a rice bin. Me too. That's what yeah. comes to mind, first of all. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about sensory bins, we're really talking about tactile processing. We have tactile receptors all over our body, even in our mouth, and sensory bins are a great way to address tactile processing, but we like to use them for other things as well. Mm -hmm. I think that sensory bins are kind of like the it thing, but also I feel like they're kind of going out of style too. And you know, we've seen some, some things on social media that are like, why are you doing sensory bins? We're here to demystify that thought and share with you more functional ways to use sensory bins to target different goals. While sensory bins are a great way to work on tactile processing, we want to address multiple sensory systems when we're using sensory bins. We want to address multiple goals, incorporate it into a variety of activities to work on a whole bunch of things, not just tactile processing. So that's what we're gonna talk about right now. Mm -hmm. Now these are things that you can do at the clinic if you're a therapist or at home if you're a parent watching this video. The first one we're gonna talk about is the olfactory system. Now this is your sense of smell and how you process what you're smelling. Now you probably think, how can you work on your sense of smell with sensory bins? Don't worry, we'll tell you. So you can throw some essential oils in the bin of rice or beans or maybe sand or shaving cream, whatever, or pasta. If you do pasta, mm. that would be a great option too. So throw a couple of essential oils in, but when you are using essential oils with kiddos, it's really important to be aware of the kind of essential oils that you're using. Make sure they're therapeutic grade, make sure that they are safe to be touched and possibly ingested if that is the case, and then be aware of what types of scents you're using. So vanilla, cedarwood, vetiver, those are all very calming, grounding, Lavender is another one. Very calming to the sensory system, but things like citrus and mint, those are more alerting. So think about what types of scents you want to include in your sensory bin to achieve the desired response from the child. Another great way you can do this is to have multiple sensory bins with different scents in them. So you have four or five different bins of rice, they don't have to be big, and you put a couple of drops of different essential oils into each and turn that into kind of a matching game, identifying what the different scents are. You can incorporate some emotions into this so your child can identify, oh, this scent makes me feel happy. This scent is stinky, I don't like it, it doesn't make me feel good. And incorporate some emotions into it so not only are you working on their tactile processing by getting their hands or their feet into the rice bin, you're also working on their olfactory system by smelling the different scents, and then you're even working on that emotional regulation and self-regulation piece. If you don't want to make a variety of sensory bins, you can try just getting one big bin of rice, but we're gonna use rice as our example right now, and put some different scents on cotton balls, and that way you can mix them in the sensory bin, they might get a little bit, I don't know, they might smell a little different once they come out, but at least the child will be able to hopefully identify the different scents, what it smells like, identify how it feels, like Jessica mentioned, and that way you just have the one sensory bin. So lots of options here to include the olfactory system. The next one we're gonna talk about is the visual system. Now, when we're talking about the visual system, we're not talking about how well you see visual acuity. Instead, we're talking about how your brain processes and interprets all of the visual information around you and how you react. So when you're hiding different things in your sensory bin, it's important to make sure that they are different and the child can work on identifying those differences. One thing we like to do is puzzles, putting a whole bunch of different puzzle pieces in the sensory bin, they find one piece and then they have to go and place the puzzle piece into the puzzle board. So simple way to do um, just a visual activity in the sensory bin. Yeah, depending on what other objects you can find, you can do coins and work on some coin identification using the visual system. Maybe you just find a whole bunch of different random house 
household objects and hide them in the sensory bin. You call out, okay, find the spoon. And your child has to search through the sensory bin and find the spoon. And then you can incorporate some cognitive processing skills into this activity as well. Maybe ask them to identify these items in different ways. So if you ask them to find the small spoon and they find the small spoon, what other ways can they describe that small spoon? Can they describe the color, the texture, how heavy it is, and incorporate more descriptive language building into this activity? The next way is to do some sensory bins with the vision occluded. So put a blindfold on or ask them to close their eyes, whatever they're comfortable with. And that way you can work on their proprioceptive and their somatosensory systems. So great way to do this is just to put a blindfold on and have them reach into the sensory bin and find something and then identify what it is just using their sense of touch and their proprioceptive system. So feel the spoon with their fingers and tell you this is the spoon. Mm -hmm. This is a great one to work on letter identification for kiddos who struggle with handwriting. So hide a whole bunch of letter shapes, maybe the magnets or puzzle pieces in the bin, have them find a specific letter based on their sense of touch, their proprioceptive system, you know, vision included, like Rachel said, and they have to find the H by their sense of touch. They can't see it, so they have to really visualize it in their brain, and it's really going to translate to better handwriting skills later on. On the flip side, you could ask them to find a certain thing in the sensory bin. You could say, hey, can you find the H? Maybe don't put the entire alphabet in there because that's a lot of that's letters lot to sort through. Show them what letters you're going to put in the sensory bin. Maybe there's five. Ask them to find a certain letter, and then once they find it, Ask them to tell you why they thought that was the letter H. And if they can't, if they didn't get it right, have them try it again. Mm -hmm. You could work on some sequential memory skills with this. Maybe they have to find three letters in a row. You tell them H, F, A, mm -hmm. and they have to remember they have to find the H first and then the F and then the A, and you're really gonna incorporate more cognitive processing into this task. Maybe once they find the letter, you can have them draw it in the air. So if they find the H, they have their eyes closed and they draw the H in, their, in the air. Again, that will translate to the paper and sometimes working on handwriting is so much more beneficial when you're not actually working on handwriting. Absolutely. I just thought of another one. You could write the letter or draw the letter on their back. Mm -hmm. So they have to feel as you're drawing it, identify what it is, and then locate it in the sensory bin. You're just getting so much good sensory processing work with this one sensory bin activity. Yes. So when we say sensory bins are, you know, losing their gumption, they're not because there's so many different ways that you can work on it. You just have to be creative and think outside of the box and try something different every time you do a sensory bin. The next one we're going to talk about is to use your feet in the sensory bin. We always think about just using our hands in the sensory bin, but we encourage you to try getting your feet, getting your kiddos feet into the sensory bin and experiencing it in a whole new way. Sometimes this is easier outside in the warmer months. So you could think about one of those little kiddie pools. You could have them sitting on a chair outside and maybe you put Orbeez and marbles in there or just marbles and you have them pick up the marbles with their toes by bending their toes together. It's a great activity to do. It really stretches out the feet, the toes. Great for our toe walkers as well. Um, but just getting them to use their feet uh, to process the different tactile mediums, they have to be able to kind of tune out the Orby feeling and find those marbles, which they look similar, but they definitely feel different. If you can't get outside to do this, maybe try it in your bathtub so that it's not making a huge mess all over mm -hmm. your floor. Your child can sit on the edge of the bathtub and put their feet into the sensory bin items. Maybe you're using some shaving cream in the bathtub and they can get their feet all messy in the shaving cream without their whole body. Plus, it's a lot easier to clean up. Mm -hmm. Another way to use this is to have the child pick up an item with both feet together. A great way to work on bilateral coordination as well as core strength as well. So having them pick up maybe a scarf and transfer it from the bin of scarves to another box and they have to move their feet from left to right. I'm pretty sure there's survivor games. If you watch Survivor, I'm pretty sure that there are <laughs> I bet. survivor games that do that. So. But also, just think about all the different things we're talking about. Scarves, marbles, water beads, Orbeez. You can use anything for a sensory bin. I don't think we said that yet. Mm -hmm. So you can use whatever anything. you have. Yes. 
Another fun and exciting way to work on sensory bin activities is to use those IADL or ADL skills. So if you don't know what those mean, that's OT jargon for activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living. So just basically things that you have to do every day in order to function. Yeah, so think about self-feeding skills. So you can practice those self-feeding skills with sensory bins by using a spoon to practice scooping and pouring into a container. You can grab a cup and use a cup to scoop and pour, and you're really gonna work on those fine motor, visual motor, and force modulation skills mm -hmm. that then translates to improved self-feeding skills. Yep, think about stabilizing an item with the opposite hand. If you're eating, you, know, you wanna stabilize your plate or your bowl while you're scooping with the other hand, you can practice that with sensory bins. You can also practice cleaning things, maybe grab a wipe and have the child clean the car with the wipe to practice their wiping skills. Things you wouldn't necessarily think to practice are definitely skills that they need to work on to improve their independence. I was just thinking you can do that cleaning activity, a mm -hmm. toy wash activity with a sensory bin of mud, a sensory bin mm. of soapy water, and a sensory bin of clean water. You can use wipes or rags or maybe even an old toothbrush mm -hmm. to really practice those ADLs. Using things like scissor tongs or just regular tongs, kitchen tongs. How many times can I say tongs in one sentence? There's a lot of types of tongs. <laughs> Lots of tongs. <laughs> that you can throw in the sensory bin and have them find certain items. Again, going back to our visual system, they have to find the marble in the bin of rice, grab it with their tongs or with their scissor tongs. Scissor tongs are great to work on those pre-cutting skills. Um, tongs are great. You're gonna wanna hold them like a pencil, like you would a pencil, uh, and just work on those fine motor skills while they're playing. Yes. And we always encourage you to have your child help set up and clean up as well. So incorporate your child with setting up the sensory bin, putting it all together, grabbing the items that go with it, and then always have them help you clean up, especially if it's a rice or bean bin and the rice and beans are everywhere all over the floor. Having them help you clean up, whether it's gonna be sweeping or picking up with their fingers, you're gonna be working on some underlying skills with cleanup. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about the last sensory bin I did with Tripp and he ended up throwing it everywhere. Yep. I remember seeing that video. <laughs> I gave him a broom and I said, help me clean it up even though he did it completely wrong, but that's okay. <laughs> I relinquished the control and let him do it how he wanted to do it and he was cleaning, so it was great. great. That's a great example mm -hmm. too of if your child or your client is throwing things out of the sensory bin, redirect and have them show them what mm -hmm. to do instead. So instead of saying, don't throw that, stop throwing that. Instead say, here, put it in mm -hmm. here instead yes. and have a container where they can put it instead of throwing it. And then of course, okay, I guess mm -hmm. it's time to clean up. You're throwing all of the items, let's clean it all up and put it away. Plus getting the vacuum out is a great way to work on their auditory processing skills. Maybe they're sensitive to it or maybe they crave it, but you can have them help vacuum or at least be present while you are doing the vacuuming. And maybe they can point out, oh, you missed one, there's one there. Again, working on those underlying visual discrimination skills. There's always something that you can always be working something. on. Uh, bonus before we let you go is to incorporate sensory bins into obstacle courses. So this makes it very functional, but also very fun. You're going to work on a lot of cognitive processes, including sequencing, organization, and attention. So maybe you have puzzle pieces in the sensory bin and you have the puzzle board all the way on the other side of the obstacle course. Child has to find a certain number of puzzle pieces go through the obstacle course, maybe jumping and crashing, crawling, rolling, hopping, anything you have set up, and then they put the pieces on, go back to the beginning and do it again. It can be a really fun way to incorporate that sensory bin to work on those skills while also getting a lot of great gross motor sensory input. We do have a separate video on how to make an obstacle course. If you're like, what? I don't have the stuff to make an American Ninja Warrior obstacle course. That's okay, you don't need that. Watch our video, we will link it so you have the opportunity to learn how to set up a functional obstacle course with a sensory bin. Yes. All right, hopefully you have some new ideas on how to use sensory bins for a whole bunch of different underlying skills that you can work on. And if you liked this video, let us know, leave a comment share it with your friends, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Yeah. Make sure you're following us on Instagram. That's where we share all of the behind the scenes and plus some more great information. We are at Harkla underscore family as well as at All Things Sensory Podcast. And make sure you listen to our podcast, All Things Sensory. It's great, you're gonna love it. We share tons of helpful information there. 
But we are just so happy that you're spending time with us on this Tuesday that we are doing this. Yep. We'll see you <laughs> next week on Tuesday. <laughs>